Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Warm welcome to our service of worship this morning, and as always, a very special welcome to visitors uh, this, today. We're delighted you're here, and please come through with tea and coffee, as always, through in the large hall. Uh, we want to say a very warm welcome to those who perhaps are watching uh, via our live stream as well. Good morning to you. And uh, it's a beautiful morning, isn't it? Yes. Lovely morning. And a very special morning and a very special day as we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday worship. A couple of notices, I think, as, as you can see from the order of the service, a very full week uh, ahead of us. But I got news yesterday uh, that I want to update you about. Um, you remember there was a petition uh, for a Renfrew Care Home and the decision's been made that Renfrew Care Home stays open. But one other home out of the three are closing and it's going to be Montrose Care Home in Paisley. So let's remember uh, the residents and the staff there uh, who face a very kind of uncertain future as to what is going to happen to them. But uh, I've been asked for those who... Uh, signed the petition, uh, the online petition and also the petition that we had here uh, to say thank you. Thank you for your support in that. Well, as you can see, uh, the, this week is, is full. Uh, begins with our trustees meeting tonight. Songs of praise at the north for, on behalf of Christian Aid. Uh, the open uh, meeting uh, for the Women's Fellowship and also we're looking forward very much to a couple of new primary school coming here on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday evening, uh, we have our Monday Thursday service here at seven o'clock and Reverend Fergus Buchanan will be preaching uh, on that evening. Uh, and then f we have our joint Good Friday service at the North Church. But also in the afternoon on Good Friday, as you can see, we're going to have a little kind of Good Friday giveaway and uh, we'll be giving away things and uh, just meeting folk uh, and just being there as a church in an outreach. <clears throat> and then on Saturday, we have our light bites, our monthly light bites as well, uh, serve from 12 to 1. And then, of course, next Sunday is all age, all, our all age Easter Sunday service. And I forgot, the lunch cafe is still on as well. So there's loads there. So that's why you've got to take this away with you uh, and remind you uh, what is going on uh, this very special week. Now, our call to worship this morning is going to be on the screen, and we are going to say that together, okay? Hosanna to the Son of the... Because these were the things that were sung on Palm Sunday by the crowd to Jesus, okay? Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Okay? After three. One, two, three. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. I'm sure they shouted that much more loudly. <laughs> but we'll come to that when I'm talking to the boys and girls. So let us come and let's worship the Lord as we sing to his praise and glory. Make way, make way for Christ the King. <clears throat> Make way, make way 
join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, praise the Lord. I'll give thanks to the Lord with all of my heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Oh, Father, we've come to sing your praises as those who sang their praises to Jesus so long ago. And we bless you that we belong and we are part of the people of every age and every place where your name has been glorified down through the ages and all across the world as it is today. And we join with the whole host of heaven and our fellow Christians everywhere to lift up that name and to worship that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And so we bring our songs of worship and our hymns of praise. Make way for the King of Kings. Oh Lord, we celebrate your glory and we want to give honor to your name because there is no one like you and there is no God beside you. Are you not the great I am, the God of all grace, the true mighty and faithful God, our heavenly Father? And we give you praise for the greatness and the splendor and the majesty of your works. You are the author of creation. And you have created us, Lord. And we praise you for your greatest work, which is of the sending of your Son. Lord, we've not come to sing hymns and songs, really. We've not come to say prayers. We've not even come to be with each other, although we love to know each other's presence. What we've really come to do is to worship and to fix our eyes on you as they did in Palm Sunday. All eyes were on you, and they sang their praises. Because he is the King of Kings. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the Bridegroom. He is the Great High Priest. And he's the Mediator. But Lord, we confess that it's not often the way we live. Jesus himself said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that will be added to you. So, Father, we come into your presence reminded and seeking your forgiveness because we have sought first our own kingdom. You just simply become a bit part player in our life rather than be king. And so have mercy, Lord, as we confess ways that has happened even over this past week. But we bless you. He is Lord of all your people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We know that we are forgiven through him who loved us and gave himself for us. He is now risen and ascended and glorified and exalted. And so may that be true amongst us here this morning. May we live by every word that comes from your mouth. May we trust you instead of testing you. And let us by your spirit bring us into a place and heart of worship that our offering of praise and thanksgiving is in awe and love of you this, this day. So, Lord, Father, we bring our offerings of praise and worship. May we make way for you, the King of Kings. And as we do so, we thank you for the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray with the words.
Right, well, good morning, everybody. How are we? That's good. Well, listen, lovely to see you with your palm branches today, um, because what we're going to do is we're going to do, uh, we're going to be shouting, okay? We're going to be shouting, um, because whenever I mention the word celebrate, you have to shout. Now, what do you want to shout? Do you want to shout, yay, or do you want to shout, hooray, or do you want to shout, yes, which one do you want to shout? Hooray. Right, every time you say celebrate, every time I say celebrate, you shout something. So how about hooray? Is that okay? All right. And you can put your band branch up as well. You ready? Right. What is it you like to celebrate? Uh, everybody else can join. Anyway. <laughs> okay, you might not have your palm branches, but you can shout as well. Ah, and let's, let's actually shout. Okay, okay. So what do you like to celebrate? Hey! When do you celebrate? Hey! What kind of things do you celebrate? Hey! Anybody got a birthday? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, any, so uh, what about a holiday? Uh, there's lots of things that we can celebrate. Well, today is a day of celebration. Because that's what happened on Palm Sunday, wasn't it? And that's what we remember. There's a picture up here of Jesus going in to Jerusalem on the donkey. Uh, what do you see in that picture? People wearing palms. Good. What else do you see? That's right, they put them down onto the ground as well. What else do you see? Is everybody happy about Jesus coming? No. No? <laughs> yeah. They look disgusted at Jesus, don't they? Sorry? They were the religious leaders. Well done. Yes. Excellent. They were the religious leaders. They didn't want Jesus to come in. They did not want to celebrate. But Jesus comes in. He knows there are people that don't like him. And want to hear him. But there were those that saw what was going on. And they wanted to praise him. And to celebrate him. And that's what we're doing today, because we are on Palm Sunday, just as 2,000 years ago, they were exactly the same. They had their palm branches. Let's see your palm branches. They sang their praises. Well, that was a very weak word. <laughs> yes, they sang their praises. They had their palm branches because they wanted to praise Jesus. And that's what we're doing ourselves today. It's amazing that all this time has gone and we remember because Jesus came in to do something very special this week. And although they started as a celebration, <laughs> that week there was things that happened that were not so much happy as we know because Jesus went and those religious leaders they wanted Jesus, they didn't want him, and so they killed him. But, just as we have a celebration today, <coughs> at the beginning of the week, next week and next Sunday, we have another celebration. Yay! Oh, you know, I hear this. Oh, I'm sad about that. That's okay, that's all right. But we'll miss you, we'll miss you. So we know that. We've got a celebration next week. Yay! Who's getting fed up saying celebration? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, today is a great day because we remember that crowd that praised Jesus and we 
want to praise Jesus here too. So let's have a celebration. <laughs> well, we're going to sing before you go into junior church this morning a, a song. A, and there's a man riding in a donkey. There's a man and they see he's getting... Now I want to see those palm branches waving furiously like this. Okay. Okay, so let's... We'll hear it. You'll know the tune. No tune. It's an old tune like Give Me Oil in My Lamp. But let's, if you can, we'll stand to sing. There's a man riding in on a donkey, and there's a man, and okay, they say he's king. Scripture reading this morning is going to be read for us by Fraser. The first reading this morning is from Psalm 118, verses 22 to 29. <clears throat> this is on page 617 of the Pew Bible. Let us hear the word of God, Psalm 118, from verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord 
we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, <clears throat> and I will give thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And the second reading is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. This is on page 1079. John chapter 12, verse 12. Next day, <clears throat> the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, our king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to sing... <clears throat> King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, reigning in me. We'll hear the tune, and then if we can, we'll stand to sing.
Well, we're going to take some time uh, to come before the Lord in, in prayer. Um, don't know what you've been thinking over these past few days. Don't know what you've been through the past few days. But what we can do is we can bring it to him. And we know what a friend we have in Jesus. We can carry everything to him in prayer. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Lord, the psalmist said, you are my God and I will give you thanks. And you are my God and I will exalt you. That's what we want to do this morning. And so we bow before you in love and in adoration. And as we gather our thoughts to think about what all that took place on this day, Lord, you know, like the crowd, we're good at singing your, uh, the praises of Jesus at times of excitement and celebration. When life is going as we want it to go, but when our plans are stopped or when trouble comes, we wonder where you are. And yet if we're serious about calling you king, then it means accepting your rule and trusting and obeying and as our Savior prayed in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. As we follow your path through these holy days, we marvel at all you did for us. And you came to that city and you wept over it. Not knowing not only what was going to happen to you, but tears for the way in which over the years your people had rejected and turned its back on listening to your word and the prophets. And tears knowing what was to happen to that city in the future. Father, give us such a depth of compassion and love that we cry to you with tears at times. As we look around us in our own day and see the consequences of turning away from you. In our cities and towns and villages, worshipping at the altar of idols or of ourselves. Our great and glorious God, we want to pray for your church this day. Those to whom you have blessed with the scriptures and with the faith and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we not be ashamed of Jesus. And in these days when we proclaim Christ crucified and risen, let the praises of those who confess your name be given to you and shared with others in joy and thankfulness. We pray for the witness of your church. And forgive us, Lord, when we lose the awe of you as our Savior. You, the indescribable gift sent from God, the Father, to us. And as we walk through the events of this week, and as you walked, then rode into Jerusalem, before the crowds, including your enemies, stir your church and us with the power of your Spirit, that others may come and ask, who is this? That we may proclaim you, our King. As those who laid their cloaks and branches before you, we lay our lives as well as our praise and we bring our prayer in your name to you. We lay before you and pray your blessing on the special services and events through this week that they might speak of and bring glory to you. And that you might use them to bring someone into your kingdom and profess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that you have raised him from the dead. That you would use it and speak to others and grant a fresh gratitude and joy seeing the cost of our salvation, of sins forgiven, of your undeserved grace to us, of the assurance of peace with you, our God and Father, and the sure and certain hope that we have in the risen Christ that when we are absent from the body, we will be home with the Lord. O oh, sovereign God, we're conscious too as you are of those who have other occasions where you know the sight and the sound of silent or open weeping. We've seen these things even in these past few days of those caught up in war and in tragedy. We've heard of those who are going through difficult times. 
We think of those who weep with relief in the case of Renfrew Care Homes staying open and we rejoice with them, but we weep with those with sorrow the Montrose Care Home in Paisley are facing with being moved. And Lord, we pray for those who cry in their grief. We remember this morning to those who weep because they are ill and those who stand with them from the royal family to those in our church family and we bring them all and we want to lay before you them now in silent prayer. God, teach us to be faithful in all of this life we have here. Just as your Son and our Lord Jesus is and was and whatever we might face, help us now as we look back once more to this Palm Sunday and to do so in worship that you will speak to us, that you will deepen our faith by opening up your word to us, that we know truly what it means to say, that you are Lord and you are King. And so we bring all of this time of prayer before you in love and in thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, before we turn uh, to our passages of Scripture, we're going to sing, uh, Jesus is King and I will extol him. When the President of the United States of America travels, nothing is left to chance. Everything is meticulously planned, whether they move around their own country or perhaps travel abroad on a state visit. And they're transported to their destination by using very special symbols of that status and power. For example, they have access to a very special plane. You'll probably know what the name of it is, Air Force One. 
It's been called the president's office in the sky. And then there's marine one. It's the president's helicopter. And it flies in a group of up to five identical helicopters, with one carrying the president and the other serving as decoys. And after takeoff, the helicopters shift in formation to obscure the location of the president, with Marine One landing at the very last minute. And then there's the bulletproof limousine. It has windows three inches thick. It's sealed to withstand a biochemical attack. It has a refrigerator that carries the president's blood type. And that car is taken all over wherever the president goes visiting other countries. And we often see that in the news headlines, don't we? In the the motor cavalcade and, and the huge number of secret service agents in their suits and their sunglasses and their earpieces. They're all employed to protect the president as he steps out of that limousine onto the red carpet to meet other leaders. But did you know that car has a very special nickname? Anybody know what it's called? It's called the Beast. And here we are on Palm Sunday, once again. And anyone who knows the even a little of the details, even if they do not know the meaning of Palm Sunday, they will mention a very different beast that took Jesus into the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And the selection of that beast was not only methodically prepared by Jesus himself, as we read of, it was also highly symbolic, as we shall see, being the very opposite of the ancient limousine beast which was the horse or a chariot to reinforce all around them of their power and status as one worthy of being followed. So here we are, three years of the public ministry of Jesus has now come and gone and it's leading to this very week that we call Holy Week or or Passion Week, emphasizing the suffering that Jesus is about to endure And that's why the four gospel writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John spend a disproportionate amount of their own respective gospels focusing in on all that took place over these days and how they reacted to them as disciples and more importantly, what they heard firsthand from the Lord Jesus himself and what they saw take place regarding the Christ that would stay with them and change their lives forever. And it would change the world forever. And those who have the eyes to see in the heart of faith know too that it has changed their life forever in putting their living hope in him. And so as we turn to what John tells us of that day, we're reminded, first of all, of the welcome of the king. In verse 12 The next day, the crowd, the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Now, when and how is Jesus approaching the city? He is coming at the time of the feast of the Passover. Which, of course, was not a coincidence. Everything is choreographed by the Lord Jesus himself here. The city is bursting at the seams with pilgrims who have come from near and far to be there. And what did Passover mean to them? It reminded them in their history of how God delivered his people out of Egypt and the sacrifice of the lamb that would bring them that ultimate freedom. That's all in their minds. Because they're thinking of their own current state of affairs at the time. They're under Roman occupation. They feel oppressed. They want their freedom back. And they're looking for one who will come and front that and be the person who will lead them into that freedom. 
that God would send the anointed the, in the line of David, the Messiah, the king. They've waited and they've waited. And the expectation now is thick in the air. Where is this king? And their cry to God is, God, send this man. Send this king. And Passover, of course, only stirred those emotions as they met with many, many hundreds and thousands in that city who felt the same. And so it was a city bubbling full of expectation and deep emotion that it became actually a security nightmare for the Romans. And that's why Pontius Pilate went from his home in Caesarea and stayed in Jerusalem in the time of the Passover. That was no coincidence. And it's only in John that tells us a very important detail, which of course we always associate with today, that it actually was palm branches that they welcomed Jesus with. Now, neither was that a coincidence in how they went out to meet him. Because centuries and for centuries, the palm branch were the go-to signs of nationalism and independence. It would be like a, like a kind of St. Andrew's flag or, or indeed any country's flag being waved in the street for a celebration of victory. Now, if Scotland beat Germany in the opening match of the Euros, I can guarantee you there'll be an awful lot of flags flying. But the palm branch was the emblem of the hope, you see, of welcoming a conqueror king who would secure a victory. And that also ties in with their shouts. Hosanna, meaning save now. Those words that we read from Psalm 118, that they looked to the day when a savior would come. So this was the atmosphere, you see. This was the the atmosphere that Jesus was into Jerusalem, that they would cry who would be their king of Israel. Now, of course, they got something partly right. Uh, that he was the fulfillment of the prophecies foretold in Scripture. He had come to save, but he had not come to save them from the Romans as a political or military savior king. But, of course, Jesus came for a very different reason than rule and purpose. And John says, you know, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And what have we, over the last four weeks, been looking at in our short series of of the road to the cross, where Jesus has been emphasizing and telling people, I am going to Jerusalem, not to be acclaimed, but to suffer and to be rejected and to die and to rise again. So he was making his way to Jerusalem, but he was going there to the cross. And he's doing this in a very public way. Before this, Jesus always shut down any talk of him being king or the Messiah. But his hour had come, you see. The Passover, the Lamb of God would sacrifice and take away the sin of the world. And as if to add to the evidence that he's the savior king, it should have been apparent by the very beast that he was sitting upon to enter Jerusalem. To those who gathered in the city for the feast of the Passover as pilgrims, even had a modicum of detail of the the prophecies, they would have known that that came from Zechariah. See your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coal, the foal of a donkey. What a strange king. What a mode of transport for a king. But Jesus is going into the city surrounded by all his devotional as well as national feeling by his very action. And he's actually saying this. This is his challenge to those as he goes in. And he's saying, this is who I am. I am the king that saves and this is what I am like. Not a warrior king on a horse or a stallion, but a gentle and humble king who's here not to establish a monarchy in the city and bring peace through war with the Romans, but to bring peace between God and you and me. 
And what's obvious is that the, the, the crowd shouts here are, are shallow. They simply do not know or have an understanding of the consequences of what they're saying. Because if they did, it would have lasted longer than a day or even a few days when it became clear what kind of kingship Jesus is claiming. And there are those who still today have their own idea of who they think Jesus is. They want him in their own terms. He's only their king for a day or for a while. And then their apparent shouts of love and praise fade as they walk away from him. There's a picture by an artist of the crucifixion after it's all over. It's evening. The crowd is gone. The crown of thorns is lying nearby. And then in the background, he's painted a donkey nibbling at some withered palm leaves. It's an image that tells that the story in the course of these few days, uh, what we all know, how fickle the world's honor can be. And as in the case of Christ, hailed as king. And then there were those who said, We have no king but Caesar. And friends, you only have to look at the news headlines to see that being played out even today. In fact, it might even have happened to you. One day celebrated, and then the next day slandered. So there was then the crowd who welcomed the king in Palm Sunday. And then there were the wandering disciples of the king on Palm Sunday. In verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, we've seen examples of that over the past few Sundays, haven't we? Just how fragile the disciples following of Jesus was on the road to the cross. But it looks as though here they have fully get caught up in the moment. You can picture them here, can't you? You know how the president has all these security folk running beside the beast, the limo? Well, I can't see the disciples running by the donkey. But it'd be something simple. They're walking beside him and, and they're just drinking all this atmosphere in. They think they've made it. Because they held that similar hope as the crowd did. That Jesus, as he goes in, he's going to be hailed as king. Their ambition to be the main beneficiaries of all these plaudits and being associated with him as the master's men. And so they believed that they were on the cusp of collective greatness. But of course they were to eventually realize they had so much still to learn. And that week of weeks, so much more to experience. The triumph, you see, that they thought was happening in its deeper sense, his entry into Jerusalem, was a triumph only because ultimately it would be through the cross that would lead to his exaltation. As we heard last Sunday from the Apostle Paul, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it would only be through the benefit of hindsight and actually the teaching of the Lord Jesus to the disciples after the resurrection that they actually began to put all these pieces together. You see, Palm Sunday was one piece of the jigsaw. But the actions of the crowd, the instructions of Jesus for the use of this specific beast, when before he'd always been walking around, reflecting on the scriptures, fulfilled the promises, uh, prophecies that all pointed to Jesus as the Messiah King. It all made sense in the light of his resurrection and exaltation. It was their very own God-given eureka moment. And have you, I, ever been there? 
You know, like them, our understanding of Jesus and, and what it means to know and follow him is less kind of microwave oven. Uh, it all happens all very, very quickly and suddenly. No, for most of us, it's more kind of slow cooker. It takes a lot of time. It's a build-up how God begins to work in our lives, either in becoming a Christian or growing and deepening in our discipleship. It takes longer to get there and then to see the beauty and the wonder of Christ and what he has done for us. Because you see, like them too, there are times when we have little idea of how God is working in and through our lives to serve his purposes. We only see a piece of the jigsaw, whereas God knows all. And it might actually only be like them too. We look back in our life and see his hand at work, or it will be in eternity that all shall be revealed. Someone's written, we shall then discern with wonder and amazement the full meaning of many a thing in which we were unconscious agents during our lives. So Jesus today calls us to a different kind of wonder. Oh, on this side of the cross and resurrection, learning what it means to follow him with a humble obedience and sacrificial love. And like those in the story of Palm Sunday, did you notice that? Those who'd heard about the raising of Lazarus, they were the ones who spread the word about him. They were literally witnesses. And isn't that what he calls us to me? We want to spread the word about him too. And so as we move into Holy Week, Jesus is saying to you and me, who am I? Am I your king for a day on Palm Sunday or a, or a, or a king for Sunday services only and we forget about him the rest of the week? Or can you see that I am the promised Messiah to be welcomed? And welcomed because I don't come and force myself into your life. I just come. And I come through the cross. Because I want to give you that peace the peace with God and give you the gift of the peace of God. Ride on. Ride on in majesty. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. Bow your meek head to mortal pain. Then take, O oh God, your power and reign. O oh, Saviour King, may we welcome you as our King and as our Lord. Amen. Well, let's sing to his praise, ride on, ride on in majesty.
so, Lord, our King and Lord Jesus, may you receive our praise this day on this Palm Sunday and as we walk through these days. And may the blessing of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit help us to bear witness to you both today and forevermore.